All right, guys, we're talking shutter speed, aperture, and ISO video coming up right now. All right, I'm gonna break this video up into three sections. We're gonna do a shutter speed, an aperture, and an ISO section. They're gonna have timestamps in the description below just in case you wanna to navigate to those sections if you wanna learn about those sections. But I encourage you to listen to the entire video. You might learn a thing or two. All right, so shutter speed is like curtains for your sensor. When the curtains are up in your room, light comes in and lights up the entire room. Now the same is true for cameras. The longer that shutter is open, the more light comes in and is being recorded by the sensor. Now this might sound a little bit sciencey, but Images are nothing more than a reflection of light onto surfaces that our brains pick up as shape. That being said, the longer you keep a curtain open, the more light peeks inside. In other words, the longer the shutter stays open, the more light is being captured by your sensor. Shutter speed is how long the shutter stays open from the moment you hit the button to the moment where you hear the click. Now, why is this important? Well, the longer the shutter stays open, the more light, the more motion is being recorded by your sensor. So sometimes you might see images that come out blurry or motioned or kind of like smudged. Looks like somebody just smudged the image across the sensor. This is why, it's because the time of the shutter being open and closed was too long. So it captured everything that happened from the moment that the shutter was open all the way to the time where the shutter was closed. Now this might seem very fast. It might go click. You might say, well, that was super fast, but everything that happens from the moment that you went and pressed the button to the moment where you heard click is being recorded by the frame. So sometimes images might look slightly moved, smudged, blurry. They don't look good. This all has to do with shutter speed. The higher the shutter speed, the faster that shutter is. It lets in less light. That means it captures what's happening a lot quicker. So people can be frozen, everything can be frozen. You can literally stop time with a higher shutter speed. So for example, if I put my shutter speed to one over 50 and I try to photograph a runner going full sprint, that image will most likely come out blurry or smudged depending on the speed that's going on within my frame. So if you're photographing somebody moving really fast, very far away, they're still gonna be blurry, but you won't see that much of a difference because the things that are moving in your frame are very small, as opposed to if you're very close to somebody and then that person's moving, then you're gonna see a smudge on your image because that, that frame is being filled up with your subject and then your shutter speed is so low that it's capturing the motion of them doing this and this into one image. So the person is gonna appear smudged across the frame. This is what happens when you have a low shutter speed. Now, if somebody was walking, you might not see that big of a difference. However, if you want tack sharp images, if you zoom into that image, you're going to see that the edges of that image are not sharp. And this is exactly why because you captured motion, you captured vibrations, you captured everything that happened from those tiny milliseconds. Those milliseconds count, especially when you're taking a photo of someone in motion. If someone was standing still, then the deviations of movement might not be that big unless you zoom in. And us photographers, we love to zoom in and pixel peep. So if you're posting this, like if you're posting images to Instagram or Facebook or anything like that, it might not look that bad. But if you're actually printing out commercial work or you're a professional photographer at this point, if you're a professional photographer, I don't think you need to be listening to camera basics. But if you want to aspire at least to be a professional photographer, these things matter because when you deliver your final project to your clients, you want those images to be tack sharp you want those images to be perfect now as a rule of thumb personally speaking i would say for fast moving targets i would do something like 
for example, if I'm photographing an eagle and the eagle is taking a pretty big chunk of my frame and I'm trying to track that eagle through the sky, I would tend to do one over 4,000. Probably if it's moving really, really fast, I would go all the way up to one over 8,000 shutter speed just so I can make sure I freeze that bird in mid sky. Now, if you're going for a creative aspect and you want the bird to come out sharp, but you want the background to come out kind of smudgy, then you're gonna have to do a pristine job in tracking that bird as you're taking the image so you can try to capture the bird in focus while having the background blurred out. But those advanced techniques are gonna be for a later video. This video is just about basics, so I wanna keep it just for that. Now, if you're shooting portraits, you can usually get away with one over 200 or one over 600. Depending on how far away the subject is from your lens, you can get away with anything between these two ranges, you're pretty much gonna nail. Now, this is a great segue onto our next section, ISO. All right, so what is ISO? ISO is the sensitivity of your sensor. In other words, how sensitive is your sensor to light? The more sensitive your sensor is, the more light comes in. Naturally, if you're going to be turning up ISO, you're going to be have to adjust your shutter speed as well. Now, a little bit more about that later on in the video, but just wanted to get that out there early on. Now, why is ISO so important? Well, because the more sensitive you make your ISO, in other words, the more sensitive you make your sensor, the higher the ISO, the more sensitive that sensor is, the more likely you are to introduce grain. Now, grain is like better explained as beach sand. Imagine you have a photograph in front of you and you grab beach sand and you just pour it all over it. That's kind of what grain is. Now that grain can become fine or very coarse depending on how high or how low you go on that ISO. This is why I have always said, if you can keep your ISO at 50, at 100, that is, that is the perfect thing for you to do because the lower your ISO, the better your images are gonna come out. Now, sometimes you cannot keep your ISO that low. You have to bump it up and then you have to use post-processing to remove those imperfections. Now, more about post-processing in future videos, but for now, the higher the ISO, the more likely you are to introduce grain. Not only that, the higher the ISOs, the more you have to compensate with other settings, such as shutter speed and aperture, which is gonna be our next topic. Now, most cameras today are fairly good under 6,000 ISO. Most people, I would say most professional photographers, at least that I know, would recommend that people to use anything under 6,000 ISO. Once you start hitting over 6,000 ISO, 8,000 ISO, 12,000 ISO, you're introducing grain. Um, I know Sony's are very, very good when it comes to this. Uh, Sony's are, you know, branded as the low light kings, pretty much because of their high capabilities of doing high ISO imageries very, very well. Now I shoot Canon, so I can't boast Sony so much, but I do know that they are the ISO kings or the low light kings. Now that being said, generally speaking, most cameras will do fairly well under 6,000 ISO. Anything over 6,000 ISO, you're starting to get into the, the medium or the orange zone if you go up to 8,000 to 12,000, you're getting into the red zone when it comes to grain. So grain is the key factor of ISO. All right, so if you have your shutter speed set, you have your ISO set to the lowest settings you possibly can for the scene that you're shooting, but things still don't look right, what can you do? That leads us to our third section, which is aperture. Now, aperture is basically the iris of your lens. A lens is basically an eye. So if you were to cover your eyes and make your eyes in total pitch darkness, and then you uncover your eyes and you look into a white surface, you would see that your pupils will go either big or small. They will either expand or contract. Now, this is your eye trying to compensate for the amount of light that's entering your eye. This is done automatically by our eyes in cameras, 
you, the operator, has to be the one who manages how much light you want to allow inside. So generally speaking, a lower f-stop or a lower aperture number, better known in the industry as a faster aperture. Reason why it's called faster is because the faster light comes into the sensor when you have a low f-stop. Light leaks into your sensor faster with a lower aperture number. The higher your aperture number, the slower it becomes because the slower the light comes into your sensor. That means it takes more light in order to produce the same image. Now you guys remember earlier on the video when I told you that all these settings link to each other and if you change one, you most likely are gonna have to change all the other ones. You have to know which settings you want to choose to go either up or down, depending on your creativity and depending on what creative uh, aspect you want from your image. So generally speaking, if you need more light coming into your image, you can step down your aperture. If you need less light coming into your image, you can step up your aperture. Now, why is this so important? Is primarily because lower aperture lenses are typically more expensive. And for the main reason that they're used in low light situations, and they are great for portrait photographies because they completely butter the background. They completely make the background uh, blurry or kind of soft, which is very complimentary for a portrait photographer and, or anybody who's looking for that look. Now, like I said, all these settings are linked. So which means that if you change one, you're most likely gonna have to change the other to compensate for the one that you just changed. So now that you know the three basic settings that will make or break your image, how do you put them to best use? Well, as a rule of thumb, you have to look at the scene that you're trying to capture. Does it have fast moving objects? Then that means automatically you're gonna have to have a higher, uh, higher shutter speed. Next will be your aperture. How much light do you want to let in? Or how much light do you want to compensate for because of the raising of the shutter speed that you just did? So you most likely are gonna have to have a pretty high shutter speed if you're photographing a moving target, more like a sports shooter, you're gonna have to have a really high shutter speed for that. So if you're shooting like a runner, for example, you're gonna have to have a pretty high shutter speed for that. So how do you compensate for it? You can either step down your aperture to allow more light to come in. This will create two effects. This will make your image have a more shallow depth of field. Now this can be a good thing or a bad thing. This can be great if you're going for creativity and you're going for a specific look. It can be bad if you miss focus and it's very easy to miss focus if your aperture is really low because your plane of view or your field of view is being narrowed so now if you, for example, on an, on an image like this or on a frame like this, if you focus on my nose with a very low aperture, say a 1.8, 1.2, my nose will be tack sharp. As you move back from my nose, things will start to lose focus and they will start to fade into the background. This is what happens when you have a low f-stop as your aperture. Now it's great if you're going for that look. If you're going for a look where you want to have the subject tack sharp and then have the background completely buttery smooth, then it's great. That being said, guys, we covered a lot of details in a very short video. So if you guys want more information or more explanations about any of these topics, please let me know in the comments below and I will make a video talking about those topics specifically and I will go into more details to better help you guys understand. These are the basic settings to get you off of auto and on your way to a professional photographer. On my next video, I'm going to be talking about how these settings portray to video shooting instead of photography. So if you're interested in that video, please stay tuned. That video will be coming out later on this week. That being said, guys, thank you so much for watching. If this video helped you out at all, please make sure to leave a like. 
subscribe if you haven't done so already, turn on notifications so you get notified next time I upload a video, specifically the one that I'm gonna be doing next, the video ones if you're interested in that one. With all that being said, thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you guys on the next one.